chapter 10 of the confession, we cover all of chapter 9 in one week. We'll begin with 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 as our text to launch us into this study in chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Not only is this the same God who spoke, saying, let light shine out of darkness, and who shines in our hearts, giving us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the same God who is speaking to us from his word this morning. And may God bless that reading. Father, would you be patient with me, a man made from dust and immortal and finite and ever so limited being, and would you allow me the, the blessing, the privilege of encouraging your saints, spurring them onward, of perhaps challenging, of even convicting by your word, by the truths that you have revealed to us in scripture as they have been contained and systematized in the confession. Thank you for this time. May your name be hallowed even now in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the, the authors, maybe you've noticed this so far, the authors of the confession uh, were extremely pur purposeful uh, in, in all that they did regarding the confession. They were extremely purposeful in, in the construction of this document. They carefully selected some words over others. They formed even their sentences with great intentionality, right? We, we've taken time to stop and consider particular words that they chose and even shown how maybe they chose uh, different words, you know, like sacraments or ordinances. They, they paid attention to which words to use. They uh, were very intentional even in the construction of their uh, sentences. They formed them with great intentionality. Uh, where the convictions of, of the Reformed Baptist would vary, from or diverge from other reformed camps. They chose their detractions from those other points of view or uh, additions to them with great care. But it was not only word selection and, and sentence structure and things like that that received uh, their astute attention. Like master architects, they gave one eye to the quality of the materials that they used uh, their words, their, their sentences, and the paragraphs. They gave one eye to the quality of the materials that they used to build while ever keeping the other eye on the finished product or the, the superstructure, always keeping the blueprint in mind, the big picture in mind. Like the Aztecs before them who built the ziggurats, beginning with a firm foundation and proceeding upward level by level, which is very logical, one might add, because if you were to put the base at the top or in the middle, they'd be liable to, to tumble, right? Be, the building would be liable to ruin. Our Reformed Baptist forebears likewise built chapter upon chapter. And a diligent observer, or if you've had time to kind of turn your pages through the confession, look at it on your own, will notice as well that there are structures within structures in the confession. There are substructures within the superstructure of the confession, like uh, sort of like a foot uh, is a substructure of the superstructure of the of this human skeleton. Right? You could call it one unit. The human foot is, is one unit, and yet it also has a structure in itself. It's made up of several bones. And in that, in that way, uh, there are substructures within the superstructure of the confession itself in the Second London Baptist Confession. The confession, therefore, proceeds logically, but in certain structures. That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to point out here. The, the whole schema of the confession is intentional, just as intentional as picking certain words over others. And it proceeds logically from chapter 1, 
uh, from Scripture to final judgment. And within that scope, it includes, uh, and within that progression, it includes other, such other themes as worship, civil government, uh, and marriage. So al alongside these other substructures, there are uh, individual items that are addressed. But the most significant substructure is the one pertaining to salvation. So within, within the confession, there's a substructure, a logical procession of, of thought that pertains to salvation, or we might say salvation proper. Um, because really, all things bear some relation to our salvation, do they not? Uh, if you were to go to you know, the, the, the chapter on civil government, um, that is not a progression within our experience, of course, of salvation, like justification is, but it is relevant to our salvation. How we interact with the civil magistrate uh, is determined by the fact that we are Christian. Uh, so I would say salvation proper. There's a, there's a structure within the superstructure that we might call uh, salvation proper. The substructure pertaining to salvation proceeds in a logical and biblical manner as well. Uh, to put it simply, and this is, this is what I'm trying to kind of communicate here, the authors of the confession did not just sit down, select topics, and then enumerate them as they went, like, sort of like a, like a Powerball machine, popping up numbers. Well, let's address that one next. That'll be chapter two. That's, that's not how this was developed. There is a reason, for example, that justification comes before adoption in the confession. That is purposeful. The chapter on justification comes before adoption. And historically, this substructure, this pattern, this logical biblical progression of thought through uh, the main aspects of salvation has been referred to as the Ordo Salutis. The Ordo Salutis. And that is, and this is quoting from the handout that you received at the beginning, uh, that is a Latin term which means the order of salvation. The ordo salutis means the order of salvation. It speaks of, of a way of organizing, still quoting, all the events and realities in the process of salvation in the order that they show up in an individual's life when he is joined to Christ by the Holy Spirit. So this is kind of, an, in, in a sense, an experiential uh, um, look at salvation, how these things proceed in time as we perceive them, and logically, how salvation uh, works. Now, if you can take that handout, that, that sheet home and read, uh, spend some more time in it, you'll see that it, it, it offers some guidelines on how to think about this, uh, because some things occur simultaneously. And that's important to understand. We, we're going to see that the confession goes point by point logically and <clears throat> chronologically as best as you might as you might be able to but there are some things that you could put before another because you can't put them on top of each other you can't have a chapter 9 and 10 at the same time but in many ways some of these things happen simultaneously in the life uh, of the believer in, in the process of salvation it's not actually accurate to say that this happens and then this happens sort of like it's not really accurate to say that God said let there be light and then there, you know, pause, and then there was light. And, you know, these things are simultaneous. When, when God gave the command, instantly there was light. Now, there is a, as you'll read, there is a causal relation. There's a causal relation. What caused the light? The almighty power of God, right? So logically, it, it makes sense to put the command of God before the presence of light, because the, the first one caused the second one. But again, it just to be on your guard as you're trying to work through these things, uh, it is not necessarily chronological. Some of these things happen simultaneously. But what comes first, good works or faith? Regeneration or sanctification? All right, these are questions. These are important questions. What comes first, good works or faith? That's probably uh, one of the biggest questions for the past 2,000 years. Definitely the last 600 years, 500, 600 years. What comes first, good works or faith, regeneration or sanctification, God's will or man's? God's will or man's, what comes first? The chicken or the egg? Actually, that last one is not specifically addressed. 
in the confession. And that's probably because, probably because the answer is extremely simple, really. And it's simple even though would-be philosophers like to propose it frequently, probably in an attempt to sound lofty. What do you think? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, on the third day of creation, God said that the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. On the fifth day, God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And on the sixth day, God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. So God made plants seeding, birds flying, and animals creeping, and furthermore, he made man speaking. The context and flow of the account of the creation of man demands this, for it was immediately after forming Adam from the dust of the ground that he communicated to him the responsibilities of procreation, of fruitfulness, uh, and dominion, which included the naming of all the animals. So God made Adam a speaking man, and not a baby. So the chicken came first and then the egg, in case you were wondering. And, and it's really a mark of superb design if you think about it. I know it's, it's somewhat uh, silly, the, the, the example, but it's really a mark of superb design. It's really a wonder that the hen, that the, the first hen who was ever made, it's really a wonder that the first hen didn't just leave her eggs behind. Have you ever thought of that? She'd never seen an egg before. She was never an egg herself. What a mark of divine design that she did not simply leave her eggs behind, but God vested in her that motherly intuition for which she is so well known. And with, and with which, that same motherly uh, intuition with which God even compares himself. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her, her brood under her wings? Luke 13, 34. So the chicken came first, then the egg. And not to get too far off track, but this got me thinking as well. Uh, have you ever wondered what it would have been like to see a baby for the first time? I know this has nothing to do with effectual calling, but I was, I was going through this, these questions, these, these questions of chrono chronology. What came first? And I thought that, that would be something else to have seen a baby for the first time, especially if you had never been one yourself. You'd never even been a baby. That would have been uh, something. And I, I'm convinced, after spending... Not a lot of time thinking about this, but that um, it, this would have aroused, seeing, seeing a baby for the first time, being a, a man or a woman who's never been one, would have aroused emotions similar to those uh, that, that those would have felt who saw uh, Prometheus descending from Mount Olympus with his stolen gift of fire for, ma for mankind, right? Prometheus, uh, this is mythology, he, he, st he stole fire from the gods, Mount Olympus, and brought it down to man, I think. If you saw him coming down with fire, you probably would have some similar emotions to what the first man and woman felt when they first held a baby, right? Fire is a gift that is at once such a blessing and yet so destructive. They probably looked on that first infant in the same way, with both delight and horror, with an irresistible urge to embrace it and an almost equally irresistible desire to give it back. Maybe this is... This is a consequence of the last few days of me being with my children a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Comes out even in a sermon. <laughs> but back to our course. And I'm sorry, by the way, you've had to wait until 2022 to have your chicken and egg question answered. But there you go. You have it now. Good way to start the year. But what about the others? What about regeneration and sanctification, saving faith and glorification? And these other questions are not necessarily, and I'm being honest here, being serious here, these are not necessarily more difficult than the chicken and egg one. Right? We answered that one rather briefly. Uh, these are not, I don't believe, really that much more difficult, though it must be admitted that they are more important. That is why, <laughs> and that is why, <laughs> amen, that is why I suppose that they are answered in the confession and the other is not. So, as I said before, there is this superstructure within the confession, uh, uh, or within the superstructure, there is this substructure in the confession regarding salvation. And it begins, this structure begins 
as every sound structure does, with a foundation. The Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the Word of God and the only certain rule of faith and obedience. The foundation is the Word of God, and there is no surer foundation than this. It is the standard. It is the only way that we can know that we know what we know. Without God's Word, we cannot know that we know what, what we know. Right? The Holy Scriptures are the only sufficient, certain, and infallible standard of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. That's chapter 1, paragraph 1 in the Confession. And it is from this foundation, from the Scriptures, that we learn that the Lord our God is one, the only living and true God, chapter 2, paragraph 1, and that He works all things according to the counsel of His own unchangeable and completely righteous will for His own glory. God has all life in Himself. Chapter 2, paragraph 2. All life is in Himself. He alone is the source of all being, and everything is from Him, through Him, and to Him. He created, not out of any sense of need, but that He might demonstrate His own glory in His creatures, over whom he, and he alone, has absolute sovereign rule, as the confession says, to act through them, for them, or upon them, as he, the triune God, pleases. And to that end, the end that his glory be demonstrated in his creation, God, by the perfectly wise and holy counsel of his own free and unchangeable will, chapter 3, paragraph 1, has from all eternity decreed everything that occurs. God made the world and all things in it, chapter 4, paragraph 1, including man, whom he made upright. Yet according to his, to his divine providence, which is covered in chapter 5, mankind fell, chapter 6, from their original righteousness and communion with God. Through this fall, death came upon all. All became dead in sin, and completely defiled in all the capabilities and parts of the soul and body. Paragraph 2 of chapter 6. Since humanity brought itself under the curse of the fall, of the law, I'm sorry, by the fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace. Chapter 7, paragraph 1. The mediator of which would be Jesus Christ, chapter 8, who obtained reconciliation for those whom God predestined and foreordained to life, just to look back on language from chapter 3. He did this by his active obedience, fulfilling all the righteous requirements of the law, and by his passive obedience, suffering and dying for the guilty who deserve death. On the third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of his Father, interceding. Chapter 8, paragraph 4. Because of the fall, humanity has completely lost the ability to choose any spiritual good that accompanies salvation. Chapter 9, paragraph 3. Therefore, because man has lost this ability, God must convert sinners and transform them into the state of grace. Chapter 9, paragraph 4. Freeing them from their natural bondage to sin and by His grace alone, enabling them to will and to do freely what is spiritually good. In other words, he effectually calls them. Chapter 10, paragraph 1. Out of their natural state of sin and death, to or into grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. Having been enlightened in their minds, spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God by faith, the elect receive and rest on Christ and his righteousness, which faith is the only instrument of justification. Chapter 11, paragraph 2. Those who are justified receive the grace of adoption. Chapter 12. And the same, those who are united to Christ and effectually called and regenerated. Chapter 13, paragraph 1. Having a new heart and a new spirit created in them through the power of Christ's death and resurrection are also further sanctified. This saving faith is ordinarily produced by the ministry of the Word, 
and is strengthened by other means of grace, like the ordinances, prayer, etc. That's chapter 14. Since only in the state of glory is the will made perfectly and unchangeably free toward good alone, God has mercifully provided in the covenant of grace that believers who sin and fall will be renewed through repentance to salvation. Chapter 15, paragraph 2. Through good works, chapter 16, paragraph 2, believers express their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance of salvation, build up their brothers and sisters, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of opponents, and glorify God. Those God has accepted in the Beloved, which is Christ, effectually called and sanctified by his Spirit, and given the precious faith of his elect, can neither totally nor finally fall from a state of grace. Chapter 17, paragraph 1. They will certainly persevere in grace to the end and be eternally saved, because the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. By perseverance, those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him sincerely, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, may be certainly assured, chapter 18, paragraph 1, in this life, that they are in a state of grace. And that whether they die, their bodies returning to dust, or are found alive at the last day, chapter 31, their souls will be made perfect in holiness and received into paradise, where they are with Christ and behold the face of God in light and glory. They with all people will give an account on the last day, at the last judgment, chapter 32, of all their thoughts, words, and deeds, manifesting God's mercy in their eternal salvation, going into everlasting life and receiving fullness of joy and glory with everlasting rewards in the presence of the Lord. This is the order of salvation. This is the ordo salutis contained within the confession. This, this substructure within the superstructure. You see the order, or, or, order of salvation, the ordo salutis within. So where do we currently find ourselves in that substructure? But at chapter 10, effectual calling. Effectual calling. We're going to read paragraphs 1 and 2. Follow along as I read. In God's appointed and acceptable time, he is pleased to call effectually by his word and spirit those he has predestined to life. He calls them out of their natural state of sin and death to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. He enlightens their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God. He takes away their heart of stone and gives them a heart of flesh. He renews their wills and by his almighty power turns them to good and effectually draws them to Jesus Christ. Yet he does all this in such a way that they come completely freely since they are made willing by his grace. This effectual call flows from God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in those called. Neither does the call arise from any power or action on their part. They are totally passive in it. They are dead in sins and trespasses until they are made alive and renewed by the Holy Spirit. By this they are enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. This response is enabled by a power that is no less than that which raised Christ from the dead. In order for God to accomplish his good purposes in the saving of the elect, it is necessary that he change those whom he has chosen. In order for God, I'll repeat it, to accomplish his good purposes in the saving of the elect, it is necessary that he change those whom he has chosen. For though they have been endowed by their creator with free will, as we saw, that will, while remaining free to choose whatever it will, is, since the fall, no longer free to will good. This was the topic of our discussion last week. No one 
is forcing the man, dead in his trespasses and sins, to choose those trespasses and sins. He chooses them because he wants them, because he loves the darkness rather than the light, because his works are evil, John 3.19. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God, John 3.21. It is in God that the lover of light carries out his works. In the God who has called him out of his natural state of sin and death to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. Just as the sinner is not forced to love the darkness, but does so naturally or fleshily, so those whom God has predestined to life are not forced to love the light. But like a plant called upward by the sun, which without the slightest reluctance, but rather with all the vigor and capacity of its being, extends itself toward that light. So man, when effectually called by God, having been made willing, answers the call with heart, soul, mind, and strength. With heart, because the old stony one has been replaced by the Holy Spirit by a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26. With his soul, because it is restored, being now led in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 23, verse 3. With mind, because it is transformed, no longer seeking the passions of the flesh as those who are dead, but made alive and raised up with Christ in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 1 through 6 with strength to do all things through the Lord, Philippians 4.13. And so the whole man is made alive and renewed. To use the language of chapter 10 and paragraph 2. This is, of course, a triune work. It is a triune work. The renewal is by the Holy Spirit. It is the focus of, of, our, of, our, of this chapter. And the effectual calling, the renewal, is by the Holy Spirit in the saving work of the Son, according to the will of the Father. The renewal is by the Holy Spirit in the saving work of the Son, according to the will of the Father. And so truly it is that the Trinity is the foundation of all of our fellowship with God and of our comforting dependence upon Him. To go back to chapter 2 in paragraph 3. That is the foundation of our comfort and dependence. The fact that our God is triune. But the renewal specifically is a function of the ministry of, of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The renewal is, is a function of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, spiritual things are folly to man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. To the natural man, the things of God are, are, are stupid. They sound stupid to him. They sound, they're, they're folly, they're foolish. When they reach his ears, the things of God, he's, re he's repulsed by it. It sounds stupid to him. And so unless that is changed, that, that reality about him is, is changed, it's going to continue to sound foolish to him. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The, work of the Holy Spirit takes the things of God and enables the, 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 the spiritual man to understand the things of God. But those who receive the Spirit who is from God, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, they understand the things freely given by God. The work of the Holy Spirit in effectually calling a sinner to Christ is a work of recreation. The work of the Holy Spirit in the effectual call in calling a sinner to Christ is a work of recreation. Why? Because the sinner is dead. And if these words have any meaning, they are relevant. The sinner is dead in his trespasses and sins. We were on evangelism and outreach yesterday. And we're interacting with a lady from a denomination that insists that baptism is necessary for salvation. Right? And I, I kept asking her, what is the essential difference between you, who has, according to you, received the gospel, trusting in Christ, Although we would say a false gospel, because Christ plus anything is a false false gospel. Uh, 
Um, but some of, sometimes the language, we leave them a little room when we interact, and sometimes the language can be difficult. But what is the difference between you, ma'am, and the man currently under God's wrath in, in hell and death? What is the difference between you and him? Maybe he heard the gospel a hundred times more than you. What is, the, what is the essential difference? And she just, all she could say was, well, I, I received the gospel and he didn't. But why? Why? What is the essential difference between someone who does receive the gospel and someone who does not? Well, in that structure, in the Arminian semi-Pelagian structure, this is what it's referred to as the pride of Pelagius, the only difference, that it, the only difference between the, the, the Christian and the non-Christian in that understanding of salvation is within the, the Christian. You have to... You must have been somehow better than the other person. You must have, have had some goodness that exceeded the other person who denied the gospel. Maybe you were smarter. Maybe you were wiser. Uh, what was it? Fate put you in the right place. What, what was the thing that made you different from the person who rejected the gospel over and over and over again? And of course, in Reformed theology, the difference is not in man, but in God. The difference is not man's will, but God's will. And this, this is not just a philosophy, as I was told by her, um, but it is necessary. It is, it is taught explicitly from Scripture, but it is also necessary because the natural man thinks the things of God are folly unless he is made spiritual. Just as the earth was without form and void, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, dead without life, until the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters said, let there be light. So the heart of man is fallen. The heart of fallen man is dead, a void, until the Holy Spirit hovers over it and demands, let there be light. And one thing that I think is wonderful about this chapter is to hear God the Holy Spirit spoken of with such, with such truth. To hear God the Holy Spirit spoken of with such truth. It would be difficult to say which of the three persons of the Godhead are more often maligned, smeared, and impugned in, this, in the visible church today. The Father is sometimes portrayed as a bully deity bent on damnation until the Son intervened. At other times, the Father is presented as a grandfather-like figure, just winking at sinful conduct. The Son is accused of failing and carrying out the will of the Father by those who deny definite atonement, or he is offered to, to sinners like a timeshare, enjoy him when and how you want, or like life insurance, just say you accept him into your heart and you'll go to heaven when you die. But the Holy Spirit is accused of so many things things that are closer to the biblical descriptions of witchcraft, sorcery, and demonic possession than the scriptural revelation of the fruits or ministry of the Spirit. What is the biblical teaching of the ministry of the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible actually communicate? Is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, is it, is it convulsions? Well, not unless you're referring to a convulsive conscience under the conviction of sin. Pantomimes? slapstick comedy and cheap entertainment which some men who call themselves preachers pass for sermons and call a word from the Lord no it is preaching that is a work of the Holy Spirit preaching teaching God's word and then admonishing the hearer to do what he has heard that is a work of the Holy Spirit sensational healings tangled tongues tipsy laughter all of these and far more are so far from being accurate attributions to God the Holy Spirit that they are insulting. And besides insulting, they are sad because they are so beneath the glorious work that the Holy Spirit actually does. Even if they were true, they would still be indescribably less than that which we read, which we read of, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Confession and in Scripture today. What is more amazing, making all things out of nothing or making something of value from something that is worthless, according to Romans 3? They are both incredible, and they both outshine 
those other circus acts, like the sun outshines a match. Those who were once dead in their trespasses and sins are made alive and renewed by the Holy Spirit, by the effectual calling of God, the Holy Spirit. Calling is effectual. It accomplishes what the sovereign God intended for it to accomplish. And that is how it accomplishes it, by renewing, by causing to be born again, by regenerating the sinner. If you are here today and you have not been made alive and renewed by God, you must understand something. The Holy Spirit does not effectually call someone based upon anything in that person, past, present, or future. Nothing foreseen in them, as the confession puts it. This is not done based upon anything foreseen in the person. This effectual call flows from God's free and special grace alone. And it is only because of Jesus Christ that that grace is granted to sinners at all. As we sang this, mor this morning, the day of judgment, day of wonders is coming. The day of judgment, the day of wonders is coming. You can either be judged by your own merits on that day, judged by your own merits of which you have none, or by the merits of Christ, which are infinite. And brothers and sisters, I hope that in this short time, this, this brief, just kind of overview of this portion of the chapter, that you could obtain a better grasp, perhaps, or maybe just a reminder of all that was necessary for your salvation. Of all that must have taken place, that needs, uh, that needed to have taken place for you to be saved. You were passive in all of this. You were passive. You were not active in the effectual calling. You were not active in God's sovereign choice election. You were passive. The call did not arise from any power or action in your part. Nothing foreseen in you. If God had not made you alive and renewed you by the Holy Spirit based upon the finished work of Christ, you would be lost, even if you were given a thousand lives to get it right. How worthy is God of your praise, thanksgiving, and every moment of your life this week. Live out love for him who predestined you and also called you. Live for the one who gave you life. Live for the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, and who shone in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Almighty God, and that is what, we would, what I would ask on my own behalf, for I am, am only a beggar. I, I have no ability in myself to produce any of these things of which I am in so great a need. And since my brothers and sisters are made from the same dust, I know that the same is, is true of them. Father, we are in need of you need of your grace, in need of your ability to better grasp how great a salvation we have. To understand, to, to, to know you and to know ourselves, to know our former condition, to continue to know it better and better, to know how absolutely lost we were and hopeless had you not, according to your eternal decree and, and, and will and pleasure, actively done all that was necessary for our salvation, we would be lost. Father, I pray that somehow from weak and feeble words that your word, your inspired word, would work its way deep within the, the souls of everyone here. They would have a zeal, a love, 
the God to whom salvation belongs, to live in a way that's pleasing to you this week. Thank you, to, thank you for Jesus Christ, who has accomplished everything that was necessary for us to enjoy this salvation. Thank you for his active obedience and his, his passive obedience, fully satisfying all the righteous requirements of the law, dying the death that his people deserve. Thank you for his body and blood, which we are about to now celebrate. And thank you that he is alive. This day which has been given to us to rest is also a day to celebrate our King, who is the living King, whoever lives to intercede on our behalf. Love you and praise you in his name.